Kelly, are you ready? Yes. Okay, let's start. Hello, uh, good evening and uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, welcome to this World River Delta System Source to Think webinar series. And uh, my name is Paul, Paul Liu. I'm from NC State. And this webinar series is uh, uh, co-sponsored by National Science Foundation, North Carolina State University, Louisiana State University, and East China Normal University, the State Key Lab, SDR and Coastal Research, and uh, Utrecht in Netherlands, and uh, CSDMS, the community uh, model. Okay, a uh, science model. Okay, today is uh, our great honor in what Dr. Kelly Sanks from Tulane University come here to talk about uh, morphodynamic interaction of river deltas and their marshes. So before I introduce Kelly, I would like to mention next week, next week, the same time, uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Deng Kai, Kai Deng from ETH, ETH Zurich and Tongji University, um, come here talk about uh, meteoric uh, brilliant 10 and 9 ratio as a denudation, denudation proxy in the fast eroding Taiwan mountains rivers. And there should be a very interesting talk from this uh, small rivers, but uh, uh, a, a huge, a large amount of sediment uh, discharged from this island. So uh, please mark your calendar. And uh, um, uh, Dr. Kelly Sanks now is a postdoc research fellow at the Tulane University. As you can see here, she graduated uh, from Illinois State University and get a master and a PhD degree from University of Arkansas. And then is, uh, um, uh, I think, uh, working short term as a hydrologist in the USGS and uh, now is a postdoc at Tulane University. Her research is use both field data and the physical delta experiment to understand the interaction of river deltas and their marsh platform. And uh, her interesting is how marsh past and present and shape the delta environment and how the information stored within the delta marsh stratigraphy stratigraphy can help us better inform management of the world coastal deltas. So Kelly, so now uh, you can share your screen and put a position mode. Go ahead. You, you muted. One second, I'm trying to um, make my PowerPoint. Sorry, I just had to pull it up, but I had to exit out. No problem. Okay. Okay, can you guys share my, see my screen? Yes, very good. Okay. So today I am going to be talking about the morphodynamic interaction of river deltas and their marshes, which is the work I did for my PhD at the University of Arkansas. And I would like to thank my collaborators for their help in all of this work. Um, Dr. Kasum Nathani, who is a professor of Biological Sciences at the University of Arkansas, Ripple Dutt, Jose Silvestri, and Sam Zapp, who are all PhD students, and then John Shaw, who is a professor at the University of Arkansas, and Kyle Straub, who is a professor at Tulane University. So a brief outline of the talk. First, I'm going to go over an introduction of why we care about the interaction of deltas and marshes, and then 
I will talk about a field-based estimate of sediment deficit in coastal Louisiana, followed by some experimental delta methods. And I will talk about experimental delta mass balance and morphology, and then the experimental delta channel properties and kinematics and how both of these are impacted by the deposition of marsh material. And finally, I will go over a brief conclusion. So my main research question is what is the influence of marshes on river delta dynamics? And we'll look at this three different ways. The first, does incorporation of organic sediment significantly alter the sediment balance for coastal Louisiana? Second, does organic sedimentation alter surface morphology and mass balance of an experimental river delta? And then last, does organic sedimentation impact the channel properties and kinematics of an experimental river delta? So first, let's look at some modern delta marsh interactions. Here's the uh, aerial image of the ganges Brahmaputra magna River Delta, which we can see we have a main river flowing into the basin here, transporting a lot of sediment. And this is interacting, This the river is interacting with the vast marsh platforms that make up the coast here. We see a similar thing in the Amazon River Delta. Again, we have a network of distributary channels that are working together and transporting and delivering sediment to the coast. And in between the distributary channels, we have these interdistributary inter bays that are formed by marsh platforms. And then we also see that in the Mississippi River Delta as well. Uh, this will be the topic of my first study. So we have our Mississippi River here, which is has the main delta lobe at the bird's foot on the eastern portion of the coast. And you can see all of this suspended sediment being transported and deposited here, which uh, gets transported somewhere along the coast. And then there's two smaller rivers, the Chafalaya River and the Wax Lake Outlet, which also are large um, sources of sediment to the coast. And the rest of the coast here is a vast marsh platform. Uh, we know that these areas are extremely susceptible to relative sea level rise. And historically, the Mississippi coast has been losing a lot of land. And so the interaction of how this these physical processes in the river that are transporting sediment are working with the ecologic and biologic processes that are occurring in the marshes is extremely important to not only the Mississippi River Delta sustainability, but all of their deltas that have these vast marsh platforms. So this there's evidence from aerial imagery that the marshes are working together with the rivers in modern systems, but there's also evidence for this uh, in historically as well. So here's an outcrop of the Borden Granger Delta Complex, which is located in Kentucky. And we can see we have this lenticular channel sand body that is interbedded between vast uh, coal seams. And these coal seams would have been um, some sort of marsh uh, when they were deposited. And so the stratigraph stratigraphic record also has evidence of these two processes working together. So let's talk about the field-based estimate of sediment deficit in coastal Louisiana. Um, this work is published in the Journal of Geophysical Research or Surface, if you guys are interested in checking that out. Um, the two questions I'm going to address here are, what is the volume and mass balance for coastal Louisiana from 2006 to 2015? And we hypothesized that using direct field observations will produce a different sediment deficit than previous estimates. And then secondly, how does organic sedimentation impact the sediment balance? And we hypothesized that organic material will help marsh platforms degrade and offset the reduced sediment load of the Mississippi River. So some previous estimates um, of mass balance along the Louisiana coast, uh, notably this most recent estimate from Blum and Roberts in 2009 are um, estimated using the Holocene stratigraphic record um, because the modern data is very difficult to get. And because they use the Holocene record, it's very hard to incorporate uh, marsh and organic sediment accumulation here. So these estimates do not include any type of organic sedimentation in their estimates. And they use a very high bulk density of 1.5 grams per centimeter cubed. So this graph here has sediment mass balance in billion tons on the y-axis versus year on the x-axis. So this is a predictive estimate 
into the future based on, we're just going to focus on this red line here, which is accelerating sea level rise from three to four millimeters per year and the modern sediment load of the Mississippi River. And so this estimate predicts that between like 10 and 20 billion ton sediment deficit by 2100. And so we're going to use, we're going to take advantage of the CRIMS, the Coastwide Reference Monitoring System data to estimate a current sediment balance. Um, and so this data is from 2006 to 2015. All of these black dots on this graph here, if, if we uh, think back to that aerial image I showed, the Mississippi River and the birds, but it's right here to kind of orient, and orient yourself. But all of these black dots represent uh, Coastwide Reference Monitoring System stations, and each uh, site has sediment property, uh, detailed sediment property, data like bulk density, organic fraction, vertical accretion rates. And so we can use this data to estimate what the sediment accumulation was for the time period, um, as well as the sediment deficit. And I just want to point out one other thing on this image here. We have, again, the Mississippi River right here, which this red outline is a directly nourished area. So that's receiving direct riverine input, as well as the chaffalai right here. And so the Wax Lake and Atchafalaya Deltas are also receiving direct riverine input, but everywhere else on the coast doesn't have a main uh, riverine sediment source. So any material, mineral material that accumulates there has to be coming from other processes that are not riverine in origin. So we use that data to interpolate across the coast and we can get these total on the top, mineral in the middle, and then organic sediment accumulation rates of in tons per kilometer squared per year for the study period. And we see that the total and mineral sediment accumulation rates kind of look very similar to each other and have the highest mineral sediment and total sediment accumulation rates in those directly nourished areas that have riverine input. But everywhere else along the coast, if we look at the middle graph, is also accumulating mineral material. So they must be getting that from processes that are not riverine. And then I want to focus on this bottom graph, the organic sediment accumulation rates. We see that the entire um, eastern region of the coast has pretty high organic, organic sediment accumulation rates relative to the western portion. But if you look at the, if you compare the organic sediment accumulation rates in the western portion to the mineral, uh, they actually make up quite a bit of that deposit in the western Chenier Plain. And so this organic sediment is essential to the livelihood of these regions. And so we can turn those accumulation rates into sediment deficits. So this graph is showing the sediment deficit per area in tons per kilometer squared per year on the y-axis for the different basins across the coast. We're just going to look at the first, the total uh, sediment deficit per area, and we estimate about 800 tons per kilometer squared per year sediment deficit along the coast um, on average. And if you compare that to what the Blum and Roberts estimate would have been, it would have been greater than 12,000 tons per kilometer squared per year. So using the modern sediment properties, like notably there's very low bulk density in these marshes. Um, on average, it's 0.3 grams per centimeter cubed. And as well as incorporating the organic sediment, uh, you actually can estimate a more a, a smaller sediment deficit, although there is still a sediment deficit for that time period. And then I also do just want to point out uh, we can't extrapolate this into the future because the sediment properties are constantly changing along the coast and these estimates are extremely sensitive to the sediment properties. So we haven't predicted this into the future at all. So to conclude, we calculate a sediment mass and volume deficit of 15 and 25% respectively, which is smaller than the previous estimate. The organic material is 25% of the total mass. A significant portion of the mineral material accumulates in marshes that have no direct riverine sediment source. And so this analysis poses new challenges to simple mass balance models for delta sustainability. Now we're going to look at some similar questions in the experimental setting. So we use um, an experiment to investigate the influence of marshes on deltas. If you guys are unfamiliar with experimental deltas, I'll just show kind of a setup of one. Uh, this is the Tulane Sediment Dynamics Laboratory, which is run by Kyle Straub. And we basically just have this like large swimming pool where we fill water and sediment into the basin. So this is on the left here is what our initial setup looks like. And then transitioning to the middle uh, image, we have 
a prograining delta. So this is when we're in the initial phase and we're just growing out the delta. We don't do any analysis on this stage, um, but I thought it would be kind of neat to show you guys what it looks like when it's growing. So the, the, you can see the sediment depositing at the top here, and that's being fed in through the channel um, right here, which feeds water and sediment into the basin. So that would be all the classic material. And then the, the graph on, or the image on the right here is what the delta looks like in equilibrium. So once we grow the delta out to some equilibrium size, we can start collecting data to analyze uh, upon the, the end of the experiment. So we use a physical experiment for various reasons. Um, we can use, it has reduced time and length scales, so it allows you to assess long-term stability. So for example, we run these, out, these experiments for 560 hours, which would be about a million years of, sh of stratigraphy. Uh, we can also get precise measurements that are impossible at the field scale. And there's autogenic dynamics that help us understand the interaction of the Martian Delta. And then the most importantly, we have a previously run control experiment that does not have any marsh deposition. And so we can set up this new marsh experiment to have all of the same boundary conditions, which allows us to get cause and effect. So here are our boundary conditions for the two experiments. We have for the control, the same in the treatment, the control does not have marsh deposition, the treatment does. We have the same sediment mixture, the same background relative sea level rise, the same riverine sediment discharge, same riverine water discharge. And then our only difference again, is that we're adding marsh into the treatment experiment and we don't have marsh deposition in the control. So our, what is our marsh proxy? Well, we tried a lot of things before we settled on what we use. We tried algae, which this uh, image in the middle here is us trying to grow algae in the lab. And we realized very quickly that we would not be able to get rates at all fast enough. So we quickly abandoned that. We also tried yeast and bentonite, but we settled on EPK, which is a type of kaolinite clay from Florida. We chose kaolinite clay for a variety of different reasons. It has an initial porosity of about 90% compared to the initial porosity of classic sediment, which of the riverine classic sediment that has um, a porosity of about 70%. It has a high potential for compaction because of this low bulk density. And that's an important sediment property in marshes. It settles very quickly in water when you add a surfactant like jet dry. It has uniform settling as compared to bentonite, which when you add bentonite into water, it gets kind of clumpy. And then maybe most importantly, it has a very unique color, which makes it easy to differentiate from the riverine delivered sediment and aerial imagery in the stratigraphic record. So we'll look at this image to the right here. And where my mouse is right now, this is our sediment dispenser, our marsh sediment dispenser. On the left, we have this kind of black um, apparatus here that is called a butt kicker, which is what they put underneath movie theater seats to in 40 movies to make the seat vibrate. And that's attached to, on the other side, a sieve that's filled with kaolinite clay. Um, and then it's also attached to this cart, this silver in the top that you can see, which moves around the basin in three Cartesian um, directions. So that's our sediment dispenser. And then you can see we have our marsh proxy that's already been deposited, which looks a lot different from not only the red channel sands. So you can see the channels here, which have coarse red sand, but also the fine grained uh, overbank material that's deposited, uh, which is also riverine in origin. It's kind of a whiter color. So the deposition rules for our experiment are based off a model from Morris et al. in 2002. This figure is from Tornfist et al. 2021, which is just adapted from that model. And we have vascular plant primary production on the y-axis versus relative marsh elevation on the x-axis. So essentially, this model just says that uh, there's some maximum production that happens in marshes based on their relative elevation. And then you have, so you have that maximum production region, and then you have the unstable region, which is below that. And so it usually accumulates less material because it's a little bit too far um, below sea level. And so it's unstable. And then you have the region above that, which also accumulates less material um, because it's not always inundated. Um, but that region is stable because it has a higher elevation. So we base our model off of this. And we have three distinct regions we use for our marsh. We have our unstable region. Um, which is from negative nine to negative five millimeters relative to sea level in the experiments. Um, this graph is normalized. So it's marsh aggradation over the relative sea level rise rate on the y-axis. Um, and then the x-axis is showing elevation relative to sea level over channel depth. 
And then we have this green region, which is our maximum production region and an absolute elevation that's from negative five to zero millimeters relative to sea level, which produces um, about one times the relative sea level rise rate, accumulates, sorry, about one times the relative sea level rise rate in the experiment. And then we have our stable region, which accumulates the same as our unstable region, which is a little bit less than half of the relative sea level rise rate. So uh, this region in the middle, if there's no subsidence, because that's accumulating roughly the relative sea level rise rate, that should be able to stay above um, sea level. So here is a quick video of how this works. So the cart has moved to a location. We take a LIDAR scan of the delta top and we bin the elevations into a hexagonal grid. And then if the median elevation of a hexagonal grid falls within one of these elevations, the cart will move there and then it will start to deposit sediment, uh, which is calibrated to be either one times or about half times the relative sea level rise rate, depending on what its elevation is. So that's how our model works. So I'm gonna get into the results now. Oh, first let me show you the data sets we collect. So we have hourly LIDAR scans, which give us elevation in RGB. This is an example from the treatment experiment. You can see you have higher elevations near the entrance channel. You can clearly see your channel here and then your lower elevations. We also collect stratigraphic section measurements with deposit cuts, both down dip and along strike. Um, so here's an image of one of those. These are important for determining the fraction of marsh in the stratigraphic record and subsequent volume estimates. You can see we have these marsh uh, seams or coal seams preserved in the stratigraphy that's um, interbedded with channel sands and then also our fine grained overbank material. And then lastly, we have cores from stratigraphy, which were taken after the experiment was completed to get uh, bulk density. And again, you can see we have our coal seams, our channel sands, and then some finer grained, the whiter material as well, which is also riverine in origin. So here, are two videos. The control experiment is on the right and the treatment experiment is on, or sorry, the control experiments on the left and the treatment experiments on the right. Um, and again, the only difference between how these experiments were set up is that we added marsh deposition in the treatment experiment. So you can see the cart kind of moving around in these scans and we're depositing this fine grained material, the kaolinite marsh proxy um, near the shoreline. So I'm not going to play these whole videos, but if you guys are interested at the end, I can come back to them. Um, but I just wanted to give you guys an idea of what an experiment looks like if you are unfamiliar. So first, we're going to look at the influence of marsh sedimentation on the morphology and mass balance of the river deltas in this experimental setting. Um, how does organic sedimentation impact the surface morphology of river deltas? And we hypothesize that the organic sedimentation will fundamentally alter surface properties in river deltas. For example, the total delta area will increase. And then how does organic sedimentation impact the clastic mass balance of a river delta? We hypothesize that marshes will repel overbank flow and associated clastic river sediment. So less clastic sediment will be trapped on the delta top and more will be delivered offshore. So some regions I want you guys to keep in mind, we have the delta top, which is everything above negative nine millimeters relative to sea level. And so the delta top encompasses the entire marsh window, which is why we use negative nine millimeters. We have the subaerial delta, which is everything above sea level, the marsh window, which is from negative five, nine to five millimeters relative to sea level, above marsh, which is anything above five millimeters relative to sea level, and then offshore, which is everything below negative nine millimeters relative to sea level or below the marsh window. So first we'll look at how marsh sedimentation impacts uh, some simple properties such as area, which is the graph on the left here. We have area in meters squared on the y-axis versus time and hours on the X axis. Um, anytime you guys see blue, that will be the control experiment and green is the treatment experiment. So let's focus first on these dark green and dark blue lines, which is the delta top area. We can see for the treatment experiment, uh, the delta top area on average is larger than in the control. And in the control, we have this kind of decreasing area through time, which is not present in the treatment experiment. And then we'll look at the lighter green and blue, which is the marsh area. And we can see that there's almost 100% increase in marsh area um, from the control to the treatment experiment. So the treatment experiment has a marsh area greater than 1.5 um, meters squared. And then I'll also point out that in the control experiment, you get these oscillations on kind of uh, 
the 60 to 100 hour time scale, which is likely related to the evolution uh, time scale in the control experiment, but that is not present in the treatment experiment. And then we'll shift our focus to the graph on the right, which is mean elevation relative to sea level in millimeters versus the radial distance from the entrance channel also in millimeters. So here we have our entrance channel. And then as you move distally um, this way. So we can see that the delta top in the treatment experiment kind of sits on average below the delta top in the control experiment. And I wanna focus on this region here where the profiles intersect this black line, which is the marsh window, this black window. And we can see there's kind of a decrease in slope in the treatment experiment in that region and actually kind of an increase in slope in the control experiment in that region, um, which <clears throat> makes the total delta top larger in the treatment experiment. So this profile suggests that there is some impact on slope and elevation distribution between the two experiments. So just by adding marsh to the low-lying region of the delta top, uh, we've changed the area and the uh, mean elevation profile of the two experiments. So now we'll look at the elevation distribution. We have probability on the y-axis and elevation relative to sea level in millimeters on the x-axis. And we can see that the area for the control follows, or the probability distribution, sorry, follows a normal distribution in the treatment experiment, uh, which is not the case in the control experiment. And I really wanna focus on this area here, which is the marsh window. And we see that there's an increase in elevations in the treatment experiment in this marsh window as compared to the control. Uh, whereas the control experiment has a lot of elevations above the marsh window as compared to the treatment experiment. So we've, by adding marsh deposition, we've changed the elevation distribution, and that's likely because we've changed the delta top slope. So we're going to shift our focus to the graph on the right here, which is delta top slope on the y-axis and for different regions on the x-axis. So above the marsh, which greater than five millimeters in the control and treatment experiment, we have roughly the same slope in those regions. But when we look at the subaerial marsh window, we see that the slope in the treatment experiment is much lower than the slope in the control experiment. So the addition of marsh is a control on the delta top slope in the experiment. So this impacts um, the, more, the elevation distribution and the classic mass balance, as well as the delta hypsometry. So here we'll look at um, the hypsometry of the experiments in comparison to some global deltas. Uh, we have probability on the y-axis again, and we have a normalized x-axis so that we can see the experiments and global deltas in the same space, which is elevation over channel depth. So the green is the treatment experiment. And then we have the Mississippi River Delta in red, the Ganges Brahmapucha Magna Delta in pink, the Mekong River Delta in black, and the Rio Grande River Delta in yellow. And we can see all of those deltas have a peak in elevations between zero and 0 0.5 channel depths, essentially the marsh window. And um, the whole peak, the, the, the whole peak of these, uh, there's greater than 30% of of elevations within this region in the treatment experiment as well as the global deltas. Um, but we see the blue here is, that's obviously not the case for the control experiment. Um, that actually has a peak closer to 0 0.8 um, channel depths. And so by adding this marsh, we've shifted the delta hypsometry to be more akin to that of global deltas. So lastly, we'll look, we'll compare just a, a quick mass balance between the two systems. Um, and we see this is really impacted by the slope and the areas of the different regions. So we have the control on the left and the treatment on the right. And we have the yellow area, which is above the marsh or greater than five millimeters. We'll focus on that first. We can see the area in that region for the control is about twice as large as compared to the treatment and accumulates about three times the volume. Um, and so that, tr that area in the control experiment traps about 18% of the sediment that is being delivered by the river, whereas that's only about 6% of the sediment for the treatment experiment, even though they're the same plastic um, sediment is the same volume of plastic sediment is being delivered to the delta top in both experiments. And then we'll look at the turquoise area, which encompasses the yellow as well. And that's the area above negative nine millimeters relative to sea level. Um, for the control and for the treatment. And we see, again, 
those areas are vastly different between the two experiments, as well as the volume balance. And so that area traps about 51% of the classic sediment in the control, but about 68% of the classic sediment in the treatment experiment. Um, and even though the volume of classic material is uh, kind of more similar in this area between the two experiments as compared to the area above the marsh, uh, the treatment experiment is supplemented by marsh. And so the total volume there is actually quite a bit greater. So to conclude, both the total delta area and the marsh area are larger in the treatment experiment. The elevation ranges change significantly, leaving more area in the treatment experiment closer to sea level and therefore more susceptible to small changes in relative sea level rise. There's far less classic sediment trapped above the marsh window because the area is smaller in the treatment experiment, which leads to more varied rates in classic sediment aggregation um, and more varied spatial uh, deposition of the classic material. And the marsh deposition is a control on delta top slope, which leads to increased deposition of the classic material in the marsh window of the treatment experiment. And then lastly, the delta hypsometry of the treatment experiment is more analogous to global delta hypsometry than the control. So now we're going to look at the same experiments, but we're going to look at the channel properties and kinematics between the two experiments. So we want to know how does organic sedimentation impact the channel properties of deltaic distributary networks. And we hypothesize that the channel properties of the two experiments will be different as marsh sedimentation will impact the channelized flow. And if there is a difference in channel properties, what does that mean for the channel kinematics? And we hypothesize that the channel mobility will decrease as the marsh will buttress channels in place. So first we are going to look at um, different types of flow on the delta top. So the graph on the left here is the fraction of the delta top covered with flow. Um, the first two box plots are the channels in the control experiment and the channels in the treatment experiment. And we see that the channelized flow uh, takes up about a similar fraction of the delta top between the two experiments. But if we look at the two box plots on the right, we have the overbank flow in the control experiment and the overbank flow in the treatment experiment. We see there's far less overbank flow in the treatment experiment. So um, adding marsh to the delta top has decreased the amount of overbank flow. And this is true for deltas of similar sizes. So the graph on the right here shows flow area in meters squared for delta area in meters squared. And we can see that even for like similar size deltas, if we look between two and 2.5 meters squared, uh, the control experiment still on average has more uh, overbank flow than the treatment experiment. So here are some channel properties and how they vary between the two experiments. We do have slightly more channel area in the treatment experiment, um, and there's more distributary channels here, but the overbank flow, the trunk channel width, so the, the width of the channels and the channel depth are all slightly larger in the control experiment and the channel length is slightly um, longer in the treatment experiment. So we have changed some of the channel properties um, between the two experiments. And you can kind of see that um, in these two images, these are just aerial images of the control on the left or right, sorry, left, yeah, and the treatment on the right. You can see that it appears that the channel dynamics have changed quite a bit on average between the two experiments. So the green contour line is five millimeters or the top of the marsh window, black is sea level, and then blue is negative nine millimeters or the bottom of the marsh window. And we can see that the treatment experiment has more kind of elongate channels here and the channels tend to actually exist below sea level for large portions of the, of the reach. So essentially this um, contour map is kind of suggesting that the treatment channels have a backwater length, which is just the length of the channel that exists below sea level, uh, whereas that's not typically the case in the control experiment. Um, so this suggests that we have kind of changed the channel dynamics a bit. So first we'll look at the mean channel bed elevation relative to sea level on the, which is on the y-axis of the graph on the left here versus radial distance from the entrance in meters on the x-axis. So again, the channel entrance is here and then as you go um, further away, you're moving distally into the basin. And I wanna point out um, first that the channels in the treatment experiment, again, are kind of, kind of the beds of those sit closer to sea level uh, in the treatment as compared to the control. But again, just like the elevation distribution, I wanna focus on this area within the marsh window. So once the channels kind of enter the marsh window, um, they flatten out and they have this break in slope that's observed. So they have one slope and then a break in slope. 
Um, whereas in the control channels on average, uh, they don't have really have that break and slope. And if anything, they kind of get infinitely steep as they reach the shoreline. And so this break and slope is also seen in um, some global deltas, global rivers of, of river deltas. And this figure on the right here is from Ratliff et al. in 2021, where they show that the Mississippi River has a break and slope as well as the Brahmaputra River. And essentially this break and slope uh, scales with the evulsion length. Um, and typically uh, evulsion lengths are known to, to scale with uh, backwater lengths and backwater lengths are thought to be a product of hydrodynamics of the system. But in our experiment, we don't change the, the flow into the basin at all. So we don't have any changes in hydrodynamics in our system, but we also produce this break and slope so this kind of supports the work from Ratliff et al that this break and slope might be to, due to geometry of the floodplain um, and not hydrodynamics of the system. So we do calculate some backwater lengths here. Um, and we see that the treatment experiment, we have uh, the top graph has backwater length and meters on the y-axis versus time and hours on the x-axis. And we can see that the backwater length is much longer in the treatment experiment as compared to the control experiment. And actually most of the time during the control experiment, there is actually no backwater length at all. So the channels never exist at or below sea level in the control experiment. So by adding marsh to the floodplain, we have uh, created channels that have that exist below sea level for at least some portion um, of them. And so we wanted to see if the backwater length scaled with the distance to the marsh uh, window. Or, and so on the bottom graph, we have distance from entrance to the first 50% radial marsh transect in meters. And then on the x-axis, x-axis distance from the entrance to the initial backwater reach. Um, and we can see that there is kind of a positive relationship in the treatment experiment, um, but it does not fall in a one-to-one -one line. So the distance to the backwater length and the distance to the entrance of the marsh window don't scale um, perfectly, but there is a, a kind of, weak positive relationship there, whereas in the control, there's not really any relationship to that window. Um, and so adding this marsh changed the kind of properties of the channels um, in the treatment experiment as compared to the control and most notably uh, created channels that actually exist below sea level. So this likely impacted the aggregation rates in the channels. So on this graph, we have the mean aggregation rate in millimeters per two hours on the y-axis versus radial distance from the entrance channel on the x-axis. And we can see for the control experiment, um, as you move distally in the channel, the aggregation rates increase. Um, and so this is kind of a signature of mouth bar deposition and kind of back stepping and infilling of channels that way. Whereas in the treatment experiment, we don't see that increase in aggregation we actually get kind of constant aggradation in the treatment channels in the uh, treatment experiment. And then the two dashed lines here are the far field aggradation rates. And we can see those are kind of similar between the two experiments. But knowing the um, aggradation rates of the channels as and the aggradation rates of the floodplain, we can calculate a channel infilling time scale. And so for the control, that's six hours. In the treatment, that's 16 hours. So this suggests that it takes longer for the channels to fill in in the treatment experiment as compared to the control experiment. However, when we look at uh, classic lateral mobility timescales, we don't see much difference between the two experiments. So we're first gonna look at the graph on the top uh, left here, which is the fraction of the delta top that's not visited by a channel uh, for different measurement windows. And we see, we're gonna look kind of right here. It takes about, 130 hours for both the control and treatment experiments to uh, channels to visit about 90% of the delta top. Um, and so if you put this in semi log space, uh, we can calculate a lateral mobility time scale, which is 60 about 60 hours for both the control and the treatment experiment. So essentially suggesting that the lateral mobility uh, between the two systems is not different, even though we did see that it uh, takes longer, it, it should theoretically take longer for the channels to fill in in the treatment experiment. And then also we see these, we're gonna focus on these two graphs on the right here, which is a fraction of the delta top that's not modified. So that has not accumulated at least a millimeter of sediment for different measurement windows. And we see for the treatment experiment, it takes about 20 hours 
for 90% of the delta top to accumulate about a millimeter of sediment everywhere. So the aggradation of the floodplain essentially is, and the channels is, is larger. Um, and it takes about 40 hours in the control experiment to accumulate a millimeter of sediment everywhere. Um, and so that would produce, you can also put that in semi-log space to get an e-folding time scale for the control of about 15 hours and about nine for the treatment. So again, suggesting that even though there is this difference in aggradation, it doesn't directly impact the lateral mobility time scale of the systems. Um, and that might be the case because there's potentially different mechanisms for channel movement between the two experiments. So I did uh, mention earlier that that increase in aggradation in the control channels is kind of signature of mouth bar deposition, kind of infilling of the channels in back, um, whereas we don't get that signature in the treatment experiment. So one possibility is that um, the treatment experiment channels might stay in place longer, but then like sweep across the delta top um, all at once, producing similar lateral mobility time scales between the two experiments. So to conclude, the channel properties varied greatly. There are more distributary channels in the treatment experiment and they are consistently longer. The channel beds in the treatment experiment typically exist below sea level for a significant portion of the channel um, and resemble global channel profiles. And while there's evidence of buttressing of the treatment channels, the channel mobility does not change in comparison to the control experiment. So implications for this work are one that volume and mass estimates are both necessary when creating coastwide restoration plans and a sediment deficit can be mitigated by optimizing bulk density of the diverted sediment and increasing the trapping efficiency. Marshes fundamentally flatten large reaches of coastal land and these slopes then impact the classic deposition and restoration plans hinge on optimizing this deposition and retaining it in coastal marshes. And then lastly, the marsh platform and its floodplain deposition is enough to produce a channel slope break and subsequent hydrodynamic backwater effect without changing the hydrodynamics of the system. So I'll go back to um, my research questions. Does the incorporation of organic sediment significantly alter the sediment balance for coastal Louisiana? That answer is yes. 25% uh, of all the sediment mass is organic. Two, does the organic sedimentation alter surface morphology and mass balance of an experimental river delta? The answer also is yes. It increases the delta top area and decreases the area above the marsh window. It changes the elevation distribution on the delta top and is more akin to global deltas. And the marsh deposition is a control on delta top slope. And then lastly, does organic sedimentation impact the channel properties and kinematics of an experimental river delta? And the answer is also yes. Decreases the overbank flow area on the delta top. The channels are longer and narrower in the treatment experiment. And the channels have a long backwater reach in the treatment experiment and are more akin to global channel profiles. So thank you for your time. And with that, I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you, Kelly. This is a great talk. And uh, particularly under the current global warming, sea level rising, and also the trapping of the sediment of the large river, because less and less, you know, uh, sediment delivered to the delta. And so uh, also, uh, other thing is about a carbon flux to the ocean. So all this combined, I think this work, is, as you mentioned, have a great, great implications. So now let's uh, open the floor to the order audience. If you have any question, please just uh, unmute yourself. Go ahead to ask Kelly. Showing the channel dimensions Actually, changed yeah. for the treatment, you said that I guess that they didn't get deeper or wider, but that there is more overbank. So do you take that to mean that I guess that there's more confined overbank flow and maybe it's even flowing faster? I guess you don't have those data, but yeah, I don't have that data. Um I guess that would have to kind of be the case. There is slightly more channel area. Um, and that's because there's more, more distributary channels. So like in the control experiment, you kind of usually have like maybe one or two main channels that have all the flow that you can kind of map out and see, which I don't have a good image of that. 
Um, whereas in the treatment, you get like a lot of distributary channels that you can actually see. And so the channels themselves are narrower, but there's like, there's more of them, which I didn't put that number on here. Um, yeah, but it was very shocking that they weren't deeper. Uh, and so that, that could also be like a reason that the lateral mobility didn't change. Yeah. No, okay. It's cool to think about. And then I just, one clear or question, I guess, what proportion of the total sediment input is the stuff out of the shaker? Like how much additional it, mass yes, are you adding? Yes, I, I should have clarified that. It's about 8% of the mass. Okay. So it's it's not a lot, but it, it did drastically change the dynamics between yeah. the two experiments. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. So Kelly, uh, you know, uh, uh, have you have some uh, data or, or experiment parameter how the marsh organic rich sediment affect the compaction or you know subsidence rich? Yes, um, Sam Zapp, who is a PhD student, is working on that, um, and we do see that there is increased subsidence between the. Uh, control in the treatment experiment. So there is more substance in, in those regions. I don't have all the specifics of that, um, but I think his mm -hmm. manuscript is close to submission. So you should be on the lookout for that. Okay. Okay. So uh, another thing is about a storm, you know, uh, because there are some uh, controversial maybe debate, you know, uh, diff uh, about the role of the marsh to trap the sediment during the hurricane storm surge and uh, uh, how this affect the delta development or even channel development. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me clarify. The question is uh, kind of what is the impact of storms on the channel development? Yeah, kind of how the marsh play a role during that kind of storm, you know, uh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So uh, we know marshes are are good for storm surge protection. Um, obviously, in these experiments, we don't have any storm dynamics that we can add in easily. We don't have tides either, mm -hmm. so it's difficult to say in the experimental setting. But you know, that's probably like a. In, if we think back to the field study of coastal Louisiana, there was a lot of mineral sediment accumulating in the marshes that don't have really direct riverine input. So that mineral sediment's probably coming from storms or tides. And so that's probably a, a large source of how some of that mineral sediment gets to the marshes and helps them agree and kind of keep pace. Hey, Kelly, I have a question. Um, I noticed in one of your plots when you were comparing your experimental data to some large river deltas that there was evidence in the elevation distributions that these large river deltas have, you know, platforms around sea level. Mm -hmm. When you were doing this, did you come across any uh, natural systems that did not have evidence of these extensive marsh platforms? I, I didn't. And I maybe only looked at, I think I maybe only looked at like eight of them. Um, I initially had chosen this Rio Grande because it's mostly unvegetated. So um, I thought it might produce a signature more like the control experiment, which obviously um, that the Rio Grande still has that platform. Um, and so that platform could also be related to any kind of um, processes going on in the low-lying regions of river deltas, such as like barrier islands or large mud flats, tidal flats. And so these peaks might not be um, directly marsh deposition. They could also include, you know, tidal flats and barrier islands and any, any other kind of deposition that's occurring uh, near sea level. But yeah, I hadn't come across any that, that didn't have that peak. 
That's great. Anybody else? Kelly, you have already done great work. How about in the future? What's the future works? <laughs> uh, yes, I just started a postdoc at Tulane with Tor, and we're going to be looking at carbon accumulation in the Mississippi River Delta and kind of the marsh's role in the carbon budget. So I'm excited for that. Cool. And hopefully, um, well, I'm very close to submitting this, this work. So hopefully this will be out soon too. Great. Okay. Anybody else, any questions? Okay, if not, uh, thank you, Kelly, again. And uh, so once again, this talk is available, will be available on our uh, source to sync uh, 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 YouTube channel. And uh, next, uh, next week, uh, Dr. Deng from Itaha will talk about uh, the Taiwan Mountains River. Uh, so uh, I'll see you uh, next week. Okay, thank you again, Kelly, and everybody else. And so, bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye.